Thanks everyone for joining in person and um, in Zoom. We have about 70 people in Zoom and, and climbing. So this is awesome. Um, you know, we're very excited to introduce our Caldwell visiting professor this morning. Um, uh, before I do that, I'd like to spend a couple of seconds thank thanking Dr. Caldwell himself, who formerly led the division of, uh, of cardiology at the University of Washington, while at the same time, uh, being a very prolific researcher in um, the fields of nuclear cardiology, among others. And it really is his generosity um, and, and sponsorship that, that allows us to have this talk um, every year and to invite really you know, world, world leaders in education and research to, to learn from you. We're, um, we're so grateful for, for his help and for you being here. Um, so Dr. Caldwell, I think you're on Zoom. I hope you'll enjoy today's presentation as, as we, well, we're sure you will. Um, it is a privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Gulati. Uh, Dr. Gulati completed her uh, medical training at uh, the University of Toronto, uh, followed by residency and fellowship, as well as a master's in science um, at the University of Chicago. She has had um, numerous uh, clinical leadership roles, um, uh, perhaps mo uh, n most notably as serving as the inaugural uh, chief of the division of cardiology at the University of Arizona. And more, most recently, she's moved at um, uh, Cedar Sinai, where she's the director of preventive cardiology, as well as the associate, associate director for the Women's Heart Center. Uh, Dr. Gulati has been a leader in research, including as a, a co-investigator in major studies, such as the Women's uh, Ischemic Syndrome Evaluation Study and the Women's Health Initiative. Uh, she has authored over 200 peer-reviewed publications, editorials, reviews, and book chapters. And as many of you know, she served as the chair for the first National Chest Pain Guidelines that was released in 2021. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, she's been uh, a fierce advocate for um, equity and diversity in the study of cardiovascular disease and the, the delivery of healthcare to people, uh, but also for inclusion in our field as a whole. So um, honestly, we're so grateful that you're here and I can't wait to hear your talk this morning. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for hosting me and for having me here these last few days. It's been so much fun, so much fun to meet great fellows and, and see the future of cardiology is in such good hands. So I'm going to talk to you uh, about women in cardiovascular disease. Is there a sex difference that I hope to convince you that there is sex and gender differences? So let me get this going. Um, so here are my disclosures. I do have some disclosures, but nothing that related to this talk. And I do have some research funded by the NIH and the Department of Defense. And can everyone hear me okay? Is it, is it okay? All right. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, this lecture of uh, Dr. Caldwell. He's very well known. And I think, I don't know if all of you know this, maybe perhaps the people here do because he's yours, um, but he was the first person to use the bullseye method for myocardial perfusion, which has obviously been translated beyond nuclear to all kinds of imaging that we use. And so this is just from his paper where he was the first author. And this slide was given to me by my colleague, Dr. Berman, who um, sends his regards to Dr. Caldwell if he is on, um, but also recognizing the great work that Dr. Caldwell did. And I don't, you know, we use this every day. So it's amazing. Very amazing how, you know, things that are just maybe to them small in that moment are big in, in the big picture of cardiology. So we know the statistics in the United States. I know you've seen this curve and we watch this curve. And we've watched as car cardiovascular disease deaths rose in women. And we really weren't addressing it. In the 80s, we started noticing that at the time where we were seeing dramatic reductions in mortality due to cardiovascular disease in men, we weren't seeing the same reductions in women. It actually wasn't until about 2001 where we started seeing that decline, red being women, blue being men. What happened in 2001? A lot of different things. The Go Red movement started then. Women's specific guidelines came out in 2001, in 2007, and 2011. Women's health initiatives results were released in 2001 as well. 
And as you might know, the number one prescription in the United States was hormone replacement therapy. And overnight, with a study that involved women without just hearsay, suddenly we didn't have evidence saying that it's beneficial for women. And overnight, that number one prescription started being used less. Now, more recently, what's disturbing, you can see in this last decade, we started seeing an increase in mortality. And that's true for men and women. But there are some glaring disparities in women, specifically in younger women, where we have seen reductions in mortality in almost every age group but younger women. So when we look at the 1.3 million deaths in the United States, over 400,000 of them are due to cardiovascular disease. The next leading cause of death is chronic lung disease, accounting for about 84,000 deaths. The next leading cause is lung cancer. And the fourth leading cause is breast cancer. And you can see that's about 43,000 deaths. So tenfold greater risk of dying from cardiovascular disease in the United States. Yet women really recognize the risk of dying from breast cancer. They do not recognize the risk of dying from heart disease. And another way to put it is even in terms of prevalence with 13.8 million women living with some form of cardiovascular disease in the United States and 3.8 million women living with breast cancer. So again, not to put down breast cancer, of course, we agree they need, we need screening for that. And we've, they've done great. They, they have great PR in the sense that everyone who sees a pink ribbon absolutely knows what we're talking about. But when... Our symbol of the red dress, I will say still to this day, not everyone understands it or knows it. And definitely we know people in the lay public do not recognize that cardiovascular disease leading killer. And in fact, by the last survey, our awareness that it reached about 50% had fallen in the last few years. So we still have a lot of work to do. Now, Dr. Nanette Wanger, I would consider her the mother of women in heart disease. And this is a quote from her back when I was in medical school. She talked about the bikini approach to women's health. You know, the idea that we, the medical community had really taken a bikini approach to women's health, looking at the breasts and the reproductive system when talking about women's health and almost ignoring the rest of a woman. And she said that many years ago, but I will say that, you know, I wrote an editorial recently quoting her and asking the exact same question, when do we plan to move beyond the bikini and protect a woman's heart? So let me go through some of the things that make women do worse when they have cardiovascular disease so that you, we can understand some of the differences. So the first question I would pose to you is do we even follow the guidelines equally in women compared to men? So now we're talking about not sex differences, but actually gender differences, how people are viewed by society, including our medical community. Do we treat them the same? Well, we have lots of evidence that women are undertreated compared to men. This is just a sort of summary slide, um, but when women require a PCI for STEMI, we know that women continue to have longer door to balloon times. They're narrowing, but they're still longer than men. Women are less likely to undergo a cath or PCI compared to men when they have an acute myocardial infarction, particularly with STEMI. They're less likely to receive thrombolytics if they're at a hospital that does thrombolytics. So again, the door to needle times are also longer. We also have lots of data showing that women are less likely to receive guideline-directed medical therapy, whether we talk within 24 hours of the STEMI or upon discharge. And women are more likely to be readmitted. And we've watched these trends persist over time, but it, is, it shouldn't be surprising that they're more likely to be readmitted and they're more likely to die, particularly the ST elevation myocardial infarction group, and especially our younger women. And by younger women, I mean under the age of, six, of 55. And we did, wrote a recent paper showing that this is a global problem. We actually were able to take data from all countries that have publicly reported data. The country that lacks the most of the sex-based information is at, or the, the continent was Africa. Did not, we didn't have a lot of data there. But for every country that reported it, we were able to show that this is really a global problem. So it's not that one country is doing it better or it's just a US problem. It really is a problem around the world. Let me just show you some, some disparities in our care. 
So women who present with chest pain, we know get less timely care. And this specific study looked at younger women, women under the age of 55 compared to men under the age of 55. And they used the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey, which represented 2014 all the way to 2018, all ER visits for chest pain. So there was 29 million visits. And what they found is that women and also people of color were less likely to be triaged as an emergent case. They waited on about 10 minutes longer to be evaluated compared with men. They were less likely to receive any cardiac monitoring or receive an EKG. And they were less likely to be seen by a consultant, particularly a cardiologist. And they were less likely to be admitted to the hospital. So it, it shouldn't be surprising that yeah. the younger women aren't doing as well because they aren't necessarily viewed as being at risk. Now we know our secondary preventive therapy is also subpar. When we look at use of medications that should be in everyone, so for once you're diagnosed with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, this study looked at this and they, everybody should have been on a statin who has ASCVD. And everyone really, if you're following the guidelines, should be on a high-intensity statin. Well, we do a crappy job at putting people on statins. As you can see, half of people were on no statins. But the odds of being on a high-intensity statin were much greater if you were a man compared to being a woman. So, you know, these are this statin is a very simple thing to look at. And of course, there can be other variables. Statin intolerance, of course, can come into play there. And we know that it's higher in women, but just from a broad strokes, these are the things that we are seeing. Now, when we look at young people after myocardial infarction, again, in terms of getting treatment, young women are less likely to get non-aspirin antiplatelet agents, lipid lowering agents, or beta blockers. So again, there is big disparities in care. And as I mentioned, women are more likely to be rehospitalized, but the problem is actually greater in younger women. So this is from the Triumph study. The gray lines are women, the black lines are men. Younger women under the age of 55 uh, are the solid lines and, and men are in the black solid line and then over the age 55 are the broken lines. So you can see this is after he, all of these patients had acute myocardial infarction and they looked at rehospitalization. You can see these lines splitting within the first month, but of course out to one year there was more readmissions, but it was greater for the younger women compared to the younger men that at gap of being re-hospitalized. Now, the, another variable in how we treat women compared to men is in our sickest patients. So in the patients that present in cardiogenic shock. So this is using the national inpatient sample. And they looked at patients who presented with STEMI who were in cardiogenic shock. And they found that women compared with men were less likely to receive revascularization, less likely to un have mechanical circulatory support, less likely to have a right heart catheterization. So no surprise, there was much higher mortality rates in women compared with men. There was, again, also racial disparities. So every time we say things about women, almost you can interchangeably say that about race because these are biases in terms of our care. The sickest patients, you think we would pull out all the stops to try to save them. And yet we still see, and we know they have such poor outcomes, but we still see that we don't treat them equally. Now, there is studies looking at ways to improve these outcomes, particularly after ST elevation at myocardial infarction. This is just one, I just showed one, but there's many studies that have looked at this. There was the GAP studies from the state of Michigan that did similar prompting to try to make people remember to, that patients needed everything upon discharge to get them on guideline-directed medical therapy. And those things did work. This particular um, hospital implementation program, what they did is they had four steps. So they had a standardized ER um, cath activation, which most of our hospitals have. 
And they also had a STEMI um, handoff checklist because in the ER, as everyone knows, there's shift changes. And they just want to make sure everyone knows what has been done and what hasn't been done. And then if they were at a hospital that didn't do PCI, then they had an immediate transfer for the STEMIs. And then fourth part of this um, pr protocol was a radial first approach because women do better with radial approach. So they thought, well, let's see if this works. So what is on the y-axis is the percent of men doing better than women. And the blue bars represent prior to this protocol and the red bars are after the protocol. And so you can see after the protocol was implemented, it definitely narrowed the gap. And in fact, for stroke, actually there was less stroke in women, but for all the other variables, you can see that there was still a gap, but at least the gap got narrowed. At least women were getting equitable treatment. So these system-based approaches do work and harnessing AI, har harnessing in some different uh, ways to use our electronic health records beyond just billing can be ways that we actually make a change and make a difference to how we care for everyone. So I wrote an editorial after that called Yentl's Bikini, talking about way, ways that we can improve outcomes, particularly after STEMI, since that's where we see the biggest gaps. Certainly, we need women to understand the need for timely care, but I don't like putting this on the patients entirely. Most of the problems are coming from the medical community. We need to increase the awareness of, in healthcare providers. It's, there's still huge gaps. We need to implement standardized protocols. We need to think about artificial intelligence, and I'll show you a few things of artificial intelligence as well. We also need to do more research because that, of course, has been a barrier for us. But I'm using um, acute myocardial infarction as a big example of disparities in care, but I just want to show you some other areas. We have the most literature, obviously, in uh, ischemic heart disease, but we do now have other literature showing disparities in other parts of cardiology. So TAVR, you know, we, we use TAVR, and, and in the early studies of TAVR, women actually did better than men, despite having more, more comorbidities. We knew that this was a game changer for women because surgery, definitely women did worse. And yet, when we look at the implementation of TAVR, women are less likely to receive TAVR than men. If we look at atrial fibrillation, we know women are less likely to receive adequate anticoagulation. They're less likely to receive do NOACs. They're less likely to be offered rhythm control or ablation compared to men. When ICDs, particularly CRT, the CRTs have been shown that women actually benefit from them more than men. And yet, when you look at real life implementation, we're less likely to give CRT to women compared with men. And heart failure, we, there's a lot of differences, but just if you take you know, people with advanced heart failure, only a quarter of those patients who uh, have an LVAD are women, and therefore only about a quarter of the transplants go to women. And I know there's other reasons, women's choices that, that are made about why they might not want a transplant. And I understand that, but I still think that there's disparities in the upfront care. So then the next question I'll pose to you is whether women experience cardiovascular disease like men. Maybe it's because they present differently. Maybe they, that's why we're missing them or treating them later. Well, I showed to the fellows yesterday that, you know, when there's this conception of women presenting differently when they present with a myocardial infarction, there, there is some differences, but there's lots of similarities. So the Virgo study, you know, we really, that was a really important study because it looked at young men and young women under the age of 55. And they, these are patients who all had myocardial infarction. And we didn't really know about younger people's symptoms, but they did show that 90% of women and 90% of men did report chest pain. The difference between women compared to men is that women actually reported three or more accompanying symptoms more often than men. And for this group in the Virgo study, uh, more, more women actually sought out care for their symptoms prior to their myocardial infarction, but women were more likely to be told that their symptoms were not cardiac. 
So again, young, that's the younger women. We know from the high stakes group who brought us the high sensitivity cardiac troponins that they looked at this too. They looked at the reporting symptoms. They knew who had a myocardial infarction based on the diagnosis of using high sensitivity troponins. And red is women and blue is men. And you can see in this bullseye diagram, you can see that actually more women had the symptoms that you would associate with acute myocardial infarction or ischemia. You know, they had dullness, ache, you know, heaviness, pressure, crushing, tightness, squeezing, gripping, the type of symptoms that we would say are typical. And so that also led people to say, maybe this idea of atypical symptoms is not real. And the AIRMA study was a very interesting study, also presented at the same time that the high stakes group presented in 2019. We're still waiting for it to be published. They've sort of struggled getting AI stuff published, but what they showed, they used cardiolinguistic technology. So their AI was just listening in on the conversation and the computer would basically note if it heard the word chest pain or any symptom, it basically recorded the convert through the conversation what the patient said. And they found, again, 90% of women did actually use the words of chest pain or chest pressure. And they, there was some atypical symptoms, but those atypical symptoms were also reported by some men. And again, they found that women were more likely to describe more symptoms than men. And so, again, so in the chest pain guidelines, as I got to share with the fellows yesterday, you know, we we made a few points about this. The first thing, you know, we wanted to get rid of this word atypical when we describe chest pain, because when we mean the word, the, by definition, atypical means presenting differently. But often when people are telling me that somebody has atypical chest pain, they're trying to say it's non-cardiac. So if you think it's non-cardiac, say it's non-cardiac. If you think it's cardiac, say it's cardiac. And if you don't know, say it's possibly cardiac. But it is very misused and, and it really often means that it is benign. So we wanted to get rid of that. We made that a class one recommendation. And we think this particularly applies to women because that word atypical often is used to describe women's symptoms. We also, the point about them having accompanying symptoms, we put into the guidelines to understand that that is often how women present. But also we want to make sure that people recognize that when women present with chest pain, they're actually at risk for underdiagnosis and potential cardiac causes should always be considered in them. And I think in the past that has been an issue, particularly for our younger women. But I, there's even differences in how we can prevent cardiovascular disease in terms of the risk factors. And I am a preventive cardiologist, so I'm going to talk a little bit about those differences as well. So in terms of our traditional risk factors, you know, although diabetes now is more common in men compared to women, we know that the cardiovascular risk when you have diabetes is greater in women. And that's been per persistent for many decades. And it might be that there's something biologically different, but there's also evidence showing that we treat diabetes in women a little less aggressively. So there, there's a lot of different variables that come into play there. Hypertension, there's actually at an older ages, more hypertension in women and a greater cardiovascular risk in women. Lipids, we don't have much difference in lipids, actually, but we, as I already showed you, we're less likely to use lipid-lowering therapy, and that's true in primary prevention and secondary prevention. Exercise, some of my earlier work, we looked at fitness, and we showed that fitness is lower in women, but the mortality risk with lower fitness levels is actually greater in women. And we also know women are more likely to have diseases of inflammation, things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And those things are strongly associated with cardiovascular disease. Now, when we use the ASCVD risk score, if that's what you use to assess risk, the biggest issue with it is that with younger women, it's so heavily dependent on age. So when you do it, you almost don't have to do it for a younger woman because it always, unless you're just showing to the patient the risk, because all of them come out as low risk. Certainly, we should be focusing a little bit more on the lifetime risk. But as of 2018, the, the guideline said, you know, in addition to this, we should be thinking about risk enhancers. And many of those risk enhancers that they added were sex specific to women, not all of them, but some of them.
And one thing that only happens to women is obviously pregnancy. And a lot of the pregnancy related risk factors can appear. But let's just take go to the immediate risk of pregnancy because we've been, you know, we're kind of in a crisis setting. We continue to talk about the rising mortality in pregnant women in the United States, which is unlike any country in the Western world and continues. So we just had the recent data added to this showing yet again, more uh, greater amount. And of course, there are racial inequities in who is dying from cardiovascular disease. So there's bias upon bias. Now, most of the causes of mortality are actually cardiovascular. So they, there can be stroke as well, hypertensive disorder, cardiomyopathy, or other cardiovascular add up to the majority of the causes of death. So we tend, we are now getting more involved in, in pregnant women as cardiologists. Cardio obstetrics is a movement. And some people are taking care of these women acutely, both in the hospital or immediately postpartum. Because when we talk about mortality, we're talking within the first year after delivery. And so those there's critical times there. But again, so much of the things that women die from um, with childbirth or within that year are preventable. So you can look here, this is the last time the CDC just reported what is preventable. They estimated that about 63% of the overall causes are preventable, but when it's cardiovascular, it's 68%. And then at different times, you know, while they're pregnant within 42 days of delivery and then out to one year, again, the cardiovascular causes are highly preventable. So we need to be more involved. And we've written papers to try to direct um, our community because we might get involved, but we want to get more involved. And we need, this is both written for our obstetrics colleagues as well as our cardiology colleagues and our ER colleagues, that there's certain symptoms that postpartum women and pregnant women might experience that should be red flags for better care to evaluate them and decide, do they need additional testing? Do they need a, a maternal fetal medicine consult or even a cardiology consult or both? Those red flags are when they present with chest pain, dyspnea, orthopnea, cough, edema, tachycardia, non-vagal syncope, headache, visual changes, hypotension, or hypertension. And then the physical finding red flags we've listed here. Again, hoping that this prompts our emergency colleagues to not dismiss these women, because often the women in the, that present to the ED are often told to go home, that they're you know probably just stressed out from a new baby or just tired or you know whatever the thing is. And this is the only way that we're actually going to be able to make a difference. The California Department of Public Health looked at if we had addressed those physical findings, we would have prevented over 60% of the deaths just in the state of California, because they do collect every ma maternal death. And so they, they collected this information. So, but also pregnancy is nature's free stress test. It does tell us who in the future might develop heart disease. So the short-term risk is there, but the, the long-term risk. And the long-term risk, you can look at it in two different ways. You can look at it in the next decade, which is also heightened, but you can look at it in terms of a lifetime risk, which is also heightened. And in terms of the adverse pregnancy outcomes that we have data on, the strongest being hypertension during pregnancy. So that includes preeclampsia and gestational hypertension, increases the risk of heart disease and stroke, um, and also diabetes and also chronic kidney disease. Gestational diabetes, preterm birth, small for gestational age. Those are things we should be asking women about when we're assessing cardiovascular risk. And our cardiostetric clinics are getting more involved in the postpartum care of these women. So we see every patient who has had hypertension during pregnancy, they have to be seen in our hospital within a week of discharge. And we give them a virtual visit to make it easier for these women. And we follow them out until we're comfortable that their blood pressure is okay. And for some of them that we know need further risk assessment, we either advise it to them or we offer it to them when they're when they're 
maybe one year past, um, you know, after they've done breastfeeding. So this is just some of the data that um, has shown the increased risk. This is from the Northern Finland birth cohort. They followed all women that gave birth in 1966. This was the first data that we had that really showed us that any hypertension during pregnancy put women at a greater risk. So the black line is women who were normotensive and every other type of hypertension, whether it was isolated systolic, isolated diastolic, whether it was um, chronic hypertension, whether it was superimposed with preeclampsia, all had a greater risk of cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, and diabetes. And this has been replicated in the Caliber study from the UK in their their registry of 1.3 million UK women, they have shown all forms of hypertension, not just preeclampsia, increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Gestational diabetes, there's many studies that have shown a heightened risk, but I like this one from France. They looked at just one year from 2000, all births from 2007 to 2008 in France. They followed them just for seven years and showed a greater risk of stroke, myocardial infarction, and angina in just seven years. These are still young women. So this is not long time. These are the premature heart disease that we are often seeing. We did some work on preterm births, and we showed that with this meta-analysis that women who had had preterm birth delivering before 37 weeks were more likely to die and die for and have cardiovascular events. And if they delivered before 32 weeks, regardless of the cause, it was still more even more likely. So the potential mechanisms for why adverse pregnancy outcomes increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, there's a lot of research looking at this right now in terms of vascular changes and vascular response. Is something getting activated? Is there more inflammation? Is that why they're having a greater risk of heart disease? And there is some data to support that. But there is, of course, some women that already have risk factors prior to pregnancy that we should have a heightened um, sense that they are at potentially at risk, and then identifying women when they've had these adverse pregnancy outcomes and using preventive therapies more aggressively in these women should be our goal while we're waiting for more of the research related to this. So we wrote with the, I wrote with the ACOG group, actually, they involved a cardiologist in 2018 and allowed us to talk about, and we, we made this term, the fourth trimester, which I think people use now, but the fourth trimester, not meaning that it was just three months, but the whole period after talking about the different things that really needed to be addressed in women, which include issues related to cardiovascular disease and, of course, other things as well. And that, that's why the obstetricians were involved, because there's so many things that are going on in that time period. But that does need to be a part of it. And I know that there is emerging cardioobstetric clinics in the United States and around the world that are emerging and figuring out how to best care for these women. There's lots of other risk factors that are unique to women as well that need to be taken into consideration when you're doing prevention. Asking them about the age of menopause, certainly early menopause, regardless of the cause, has an increased risk with cardiovascular disease. Age of first birth also increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so what we did is we summarized this in terms of those risk enhancers we should be talking about in our clinic or collecting the data on. If you're seeing a young woman, you know, asking them about their age of menarche, asking them about polycystic ovarian syndrome, asking them if they are using oral contraceptives and for how long, but particularly having a heightened awareness if they smoke and they're on oral contraceptives. For re during the reproductive years, again, asking them of their age of first birth, adverse pregnancy outcomes, as we just talked about, F fertility therapies increase the risk of hypertension, at least during pregnancy. We don't have a signal that it increases cardiovascular events in the future. But again, right now, that data, you know, people that can afford fertility therapy it is different in terms of who's all getting this right now. And now as some places are offering it um, as more part of the healthcare packages, it may be different over time. 
Premature menopause, of course, increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, ovarian insufficiency, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. All of those things should be asked. That's much more common in people who are anemic or bulimic, but we should be asking if they have that history because there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And in our older women, again, asking them about all the risk factors, including their menopausal history and their use of hormone replacement therapy. So a lifetime of prevention, depending on when we encounter them, of course. And that really is my approach. When I'm doing caring for women, I still use the ASCVD risk score or sometimes the MESA risk score if I have a coronary calcium on them to assess their initial risk. But then I try to identify who's high risk, meaning are they a veteran woman? Are they a black woman? Are they a South Asian woman? Those groups are obviously at a heightened risk. Then we ask about those sex-specific risk factors that we discussed, or the female predominant conditions, things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And that's our way to personalize it for the patients. I think that you know all the fancy genetics we can do, if we don't even take into consideration if you're male or female, we aren't doing justice by our patients. But some of the reasons that we haven't really thought about heart disease in women or, or are catching up on our understanding is really that we haven't included women in a lot of our clinical trials. And so I love this cartoon. This cartoon, it, it's so real for cardiology. We have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkeys, and men with this condition, but medical research using women just never occurred to anyone. And this is really true in the cardiology world. And in fact, Bernadine Healy, who was the first woman to head up the NIH, and she was a cardiologist, she wrote this, this editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine about the Yentl syndrome. And for those of you that don't know the story of Yentl, you can either read the story or watch the movie. Barbara Streisand starred in the movie. And her the the Yentl was basically a woman who wanted to study the Talmud, but could not because she was a woman. And so she disguised herself as a man. And the analogy was that Dr. Healy was trying to draw was that do women have to present just like men? Does everything just like men? Because they had not been included in the trials. She is the person that pushed the NIH and actually the government to fund the Women's Health Initiative. And the, and also pushed the NIH to be more inclusive of women. And she started the Office of Women's Health Research during her tenure there. So when we look at cardiology trials, you can see here when they adjust for the prevalence of the disease, this is from US trials, how well have we enrolled women? Well, for pulmonary hypertension, hypertension, and atrial fibrillation, we've actually done a good job of getting women now in trials. But common things being common, heart failure and coronary artery disease are the diseases that we aren't enrolling enough women. And then from a global perspective, this paper was published in 2020, looking at it globally. And they found the same thing, pulmonary hypertension being the one outlier, heart failure, again, being the worst about enrolling women. Device therapies, again, less likely to enroll women, but all it didn't matter if you looked at drugs, devices, lifestyle interventions, procedures, women are less likely to be involved in those trials in cardiology. It didn't matter where the studies were done in the world, less likely to involve women. Didn't matter if it was a small study or a large study. Age, they did see that more women under the age of 55 are being included in trials, but that's still leaving out older women who do live longer and, and do develop cardiovascular disease, and we do need to know about them. And it didn't matter about the sponsor either, although interestingly enough, in this global analysis, if government funding was used in the trials, there is actually less likelihood of enrollment of women in the trials. So, I mean, it means that the government funding isn't tied with accountability to represent its population. So, and again, that is global. That's not just NIH. So that, that, that was global. So why does it matter? Well, sex matters. So does gender. Both of them. I've showed you ways that, that things differ based on sex and things differ by gender. But by, biologically, every cell has a sex. So therefore, every gene and every molecule is influenced by the biological sex. And of course, gender influences how we approach patients, how we care for them. So both are important, but if we're not including 
people who are women who identify as women or biologically female into our trials, we are failing a big portion of our population. And this is why we really need to be more inclusive. And again, I'll jump to the example of ischemic heart disease. Again, just as one way that we can talk about this is, you know, ischemic heart disease, we thought we know things, we know obstructive coronary disease, and, you know, we started looking at women and realizing they don't have obstructive coronary disease at the same rate as men. And yet they too have STEMI or they have evidence of ischemia. And then we started exploring these ideas like SCAD and microvascular dysfunction and uh, coronary artery spasm. You know, the male pattern may be more obstructive, but the female pattern may be more likely to be in the small vessels. And so these sex differences for ischemic heart disease matter in terms of not just the risk factors and how they present, but also the gender-based issues related to access of care. But all of this contributes to why they do worse. And that's just one example. There's many other examples out there. You know, we can look at drugs because we use obviously drugs all the time on many of our patients. But we need to, when we do studies, there's not often the consideration, is this metabolized differently in women? And this is just from a paper in the Journal of Cardiac Failure that we were just gen generically saying how drugs are metabolized. There's differences in absorption of drugs, distribution, metabolism, elimination, and it may matter for women versus men, but also for pregnant women, there's differences. If we don't understand those differences, then we will have problems in understanding why women might have more side effects to certain medications. Just to use the easiest example, hypertension, we use obviously a lot of drugs and women, although women are more likely to actually get medications for hypertension and be treated, women are less likely to adhere to hypertensive therapies. Well, per perhaps it's because sometimes the side effects are hard for them to tolerate. You think of just things like diuretics, the plasma concentration of diuretics is actually higher in women. So it shouldn't be surprising that there's more electrolyte disturbances in women, and there's a higher, therefore a higher antiarrhythmic risk. Beta blockers actually lower heart rate greater in women and lower blood pressure greater in women. So maybe the same dose is not the right dose for women. And these are things that we should be considering when we're planning studies or when we're looking at new therapies. Are there differences because of how they might be metabolized differently? So lastly, I just want to give you though a partial viewpoint of why women weren't included in trials most recently and what the history has been. So some of you may know a drug called thalidomide that in the 1960s was used for morning sickness in Europe predominantly. And although it did help with people's morning sickness, unfortunately, it caused harm to the fetus. So almost immediately in the United States, the FDA said we, women of childbearing potential cannot be included in trials. So phase one, phase two, done. And that really started, you know, lowering any chance of women being in trials. Now, in the 1980s, the um, FDA started having some requirements of who needed to be studied. Surprisingly, race and sex didn't come up at that time. The NIH, though, in the 80s did start suggesting that women should be included in studies, but they didn't, they didn't make it mandatory. They just said you should. But then in the 90s, that's when Bernadine Healy uh, headed up the NIH you know, she made the Office of Women's Health Research. She pushed Congress to mandate inclusion of women in trials, which they did. But again, they never put in any sort of man, the mandates there, but not any repercussions or how, you know, how, how they were going to implement it. So then in um, the 2000s, the FDA um, started being concerned that some drugs were being used in patients, had to be used in patients who were pregnant. So they wanted to have a registry. So they started asking all of us to report patients who were pregnant, who were had to stay on drugs for whatever reason, or ended up being on drugs to show what do we know about that? Because of course, that's a group that we've studied the least well. And then into in the 2010s, uh, the FDA started making some expectations for medical devices, noting that women really weren't included in lots of the device trials, particularly related to cardiology. But it was only in 2022, 
that the FDA created a framework actually asking sex and gender to be reported in these device trials. This is just last year. And there's the Institute of Medicine at the same year, 2022, also came out with a statement as well, asking for diversity in trials and also the inclusion of women in trials. So when you think about this, we're, we're, we're just still addressing this problem about inclusion in our trials. And it, it gets a little bit worse because if you think about how we learn disease, you know, we usually learn something about cells, then we learn about it in the animals, and then we go to the humans. Well, guess what? When we did cell studies and animal studies, they were using male cell lines and male animal studies. And for anyone here that's a basic scientist, you know, it costs more to have male and female, um, particularly animal studies. And so it wasn't until 2014 that Janine Clayton and Francis Collin from the NIH and Janine is from the Office of Women's Health Research actually wrote about this inequity in the cell line studies and in the um, animal studies, and they unveiled a policy that went into effect in only 2016, saying that when they're funding a study that includes either of those, they have to report it by sex, and it has to be half and half. So it's, I know for basic science investigators, it's created more work, they've required more funding, you know, and, and all the other things that make it difficult. But it is good for us to have that because, you know, those even animal studies, I don't know why they didn't use female animals, but they do have that pesky problem of getting pregnant. But it's good, we'll learn more about that. And that's actually something that will help us take care of women as well. So that's how early we are. And lastly, I just want to show you, though, despite the FDA trying to push us, and we obviously have a cardiologist leading, and, and I know that uh, he, he really does understand these issues, but when you look at the accountability, I just want you to pay attention to this yellow line here. This is all the cardiac trials. These are for therapeutics that have been submitted to the FDA and the percent of women included in these trials. And you can see how good cardiology is doing. For the cardiac drugs, we're, we're really low. You know, we're, we're like in 2019, we were under 20% and we're going up a little, we're about 30% in 2020. You look at GI, the other, this orange line here, they're doing great. And other, other areas, they are actually do, really changing how they're studying both sexes. We need to do better. We need to hold our researchers, our community more accountable because we write at this point in time, we don't still have enough information about women. We know we need more diversity in our trials. We've written papers about this, about how we know it, the, this is not just a woman problem. It, this is an intersectional problem. We know it applies to people of diverse backgrounds. Um, people, our trans population is not represented in trials as well. So that all these groups need to be included in trials. And we talked about they're being underrepresented, sometimes underreported. It limits the potential. We recognize there's barriers to getting people into trials, but we need to figure out how to overcome those trials. And part of that is making our community more diverse because that is our way to learn and enter the communities that we haven't been entering. And there's different issues related for women versus other diverse populations, but we tried to summarize that by also expanding our investigative team. We know that there's less women trialists and less people of diverse background as trialists. And that matters because at every level, people might decide because someone looks like them and is asking them about the trial to, to be part of the trial. So again, we, we still have long ways to go. So I think some of the ways that we can improve the care of women's hearts is certainly, as I already said, increasing the diversity in our trials and being looking like our population. And women represent 52% of the population. So that's the majority. It's not a special population. We need to apply our guidelines equally. That's the easiest thing we can do to save lives right now. We can try to look at where our bias is and trying to uh, correct bias and think about the bias that's already existing in our care.
I think women's heart centers is part of the solution right now because of the emerging data and the need for focused care. And I'm excited to hear um, yesterday that this is an initiative that's probably going to happen here. We need more of them because this is the only way to change things. It's also a way to get the women more into trials because those are recruiting sites always. And we need to continue to follow our metrics. We can't let go because if we don't follow our metrics, we're not going to know that we're making change. So, um, so I, I will end there and take, hopefully I left you time for questions, but again, um, sorry for the whirlwind tour about women's hearts. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Gulati. We're very lucky to have you here. That was a wonderful talk. We're going to do Q&A now, um, and I'm going to be monitoring the chat while Aris uh, walks around the room and uh, gets any questions from the audience. I was hoping to start with a question of my own, if that's all right. Um, I know you've been a program director in cardiology. Uh, from my perspective, one of the biggest or easiest ways to improve the care of women in cardiology practice is by diversifying our, diversifying our own workforce. Do you have any thoughts or concrete steps that the cardiology community should be taking in order to improve the representation of women in cardiology and especially in the procedural fields like electrophysiology and interventional? Yeah, that's a great question. And we, we definitely do need to diversify our cardiology community. And I think there's been a lot of efforts, extraordinary efforts by the American College of Cardiology to do that starting young and younger. I think that is the way to get people interested. So, you know, we have our internal medicine cohorts that we are trying to, people from diverse backgrounds as well as women, their different cohorts that they've created and help them through the process and to understand that. But, you know, we've even started earlier than that. We've done inner city high school programs. I did, I did created one in Phoenix and I created one a long time ago in Chicago where we introduced young, young women and people from diverse backgrounds that to what is in the field of cardiology? Would they all become cardiologists? Maybe not, but we expose them to all facets of, of the specialty, including our, you know, our technicians, as well as our nurses, our nurse practitioners, our dietitians, epidemiologists, so that they saw a spectrum of things that might interest them. And we called it, you know, they went to cardiology camp for a week. Um, and, and it was really amazing. And I still follow those. They, a lot of them stay in touch with me. And everyone from our initial cohort actually went into meta, either into a medical field, which was amazing. And we need things like that. I think the younger we go, that we show them that they're, they don't, People from different backgrounds don't always have somebody in their community that they know what does it mean to be a cardiologist or, or to be in medicine. And I think opening those doors is, is so important as well. But from a fellowship, you know, from an application standpoint, I do think that when we, you know, I don't know how you do it here. And maybe you guys don't know as fellows how they do it, but they, you know, we all make sort of a grading or scale for different things that we think is important, whether it's the uh, board exam scores or whether it's, you know, the, where they train, we give a certain score for, you know, what we think that, you know, their letters, et cetera. But we added a diversity score. And, and we, we asked our interviewers to ask questions, not whether they were diverse, you know, just that they looked diverse or that they were women or whatever. No, just that they had cultural sensitivity. Did they, you know, work in communities? Did they, did they have experiences that they shared during their interview that made us understand? And you had to actually write the example in. And that was something that my friend Quinn Capers, at Ohio, he was at Ohio State and we worked together and he's now at UT Southwestern. He, we did that at OSU. So I added it to ours. And I think things like that can change the components and the makeup. Of, of your class. I think also understanding where people came from, that sometimes scores may not represent always that that, is a, the, that shouldn't be the only measure to how we choose our candidates, so. Thank you. I want to ask a question for this microphone thwarted my efforts, I'm sorry. So um, 
I was really struck by the slides you showed about, you know, underutilization of procedural uh, interventions that are sometimes very effective, such as CRT in women. And, you know, you know, I'm going into heart failure, so that perhaps translates to mechanical circulatory support too, although not so proven. So uh, why do you think we're, we're doing that? Are we sort of like, do we have an implicit bias that causes us to think that perhaps women are, you know, uh, more frail? Do we misclassify women as such or? Yeah, I mean, it could be all of those things. You know, frailty does obviously weigh into decisions that we make about certain devices and not doing. And we do certainly know that when women develop cardiovascular disease, many of them are at older ages and that this is a big, you know, big issue. But for things like TAVR, if you think about, you know, TAVR as, as a, just an example, you know, even in those studies, those were very, in the early partner studies, those were very old, older women and older men. And they had multiple comorbidities. These were the, they were trying to find people that, you know, they couldn't operate on. And yet we still, we saw that women did better. So we, we need to, I do think that there's some component of bias that women might not do as well. And they don't even get offered sometimes a therapy. Like, the decision making should be shared decision making, just like everything that we do, but it should be offered and it should be considered in everyone. And I think that that, that is a big problem because we often hear from our patients, even simple things like atrial fibrillation. Nobody, they told me I have an atrial fibrillation, but they told me, they just said I wasn't safe for anticoagulation. And it, usually you're finding them in clinic and you're like, you haven't had a fall. You haven't, you know, nobody really assess their their real risk. So I think that there is bias, but there is always going to be other variables too that might be the reason, but we should at least correct our bias. Fantastic. We have a question from our online audience from Dr. Catherine Otto. She says, great talk. Um, once we ask women about these special risk factors, what do we do? Any recommendations about estrogen at uh, the time of menopause and beyond? estrogen at the time of menopause? Maybe. I think maybe it was a two-part question. Okay. One, what do we do once we identify special risk factors in women? How does that modify our primary or secondary prevention? And then two, do you have any recommendations about estrogen therapy? Well, for the, when we do cardiac risk assessment, I think the idea is if you have these other risk enhancers present, it might make you do some other type of study to assess the risk further or to upgrade them, meaning that we use those risk enhancers frequently to make a decision of somebody who's intermediate risk, are they high risk actually, or are they low risk using, you know, sometimes using a coronary artery calcium score. So in the preventive community, I think that's a lot of how we will use those risk enhancers. And, and there were more risk enhancers, of course, that are not even sex specific, but that would help us, you know, if they're present when someone's coming in for preventive screening, that's how I use it. In terms of estrogen use for um, menopausal women. So certainly, I, everybody who wants to criticize the Women's Health Initiative, it, there will never be a study done like the Women's Health Initiative again, just because it was so expensive to do. Admittedly, the hormones that they use then are nothing like the hormones that we have for women now. They're much lower in estrogen. And um, our recommendation, though, has really not changed, though, that certainly if women need them for symptoms, you can use them for the shortest duration. Um, but definitely not use them first. You're not doing primary prevention by using hormone replacement therapy. We don't have data for that. I do think that the, you know people that are going through menopause and who are highly symptomatic, we should feel a little reassured though, because even in the sub-analysis of the Women's Health Initiative, it was the younger people that were probably benefited from hormone replacement therapy, or at least had a null effect. Um, versus, you know, how the WHI was, is they enrolled women that were 80 years old who, and just asked them to stop taking HRT, and then they, or if they were even on it, but then randomized them to one of the two arms. So it, I don't think, you know, the people who are going through menopause is probably the people that they should have studied in that trial, but 
again, a shortest duration, lowest dose of estrogen, keep asking them at every visit, do they think they still need it? Because sometimes these medications are just left on. And if they do develop car cardiovascular disease over time, to ensure for certain that you stop the drug then. Thank you for that response. We probably have time for one in-person question. Does anyone have it? I see Dr. Stempi Notero. I'm going to take the working mic. <laughs> I've got multiple mics. I just wanted, you know, there was a recent publication on uh, cabbage in women versus men in JAMA cardiology, and I'm now afraid to send any woman to cabbage. Um, for those of you that didn't read it, it showed that the mortality for women um, for cabbage has actually increased over the last 10 years as opposed to decreasing. Any opinions, thoughts on that? Yeah, we continue to see the this difference after with cabbage um, for now going on more than three decades that women do worse with bypass compared to men. So we, it, it's amazing every time we do get a study that we haven't really narrowed that gap. And that, you know, that's also the story with surgical valve replacement too, which is why TAVR to, to most of us was kind of shocking just how well women did because always on the surgical data, we continue to see these differences. Thank you all for attending Grand Rounds. Thank you, Dr. Galati.